Uh, I am honored to be the authority on growing big bluegill. <laughs> We just got to keep them alive, and that's what we fully intend to do this next go around. So, I can see it now. I can literally envision that feeder going off and fish coming to feed. And let me tell you something like the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. One of the trips I took recently was down to Auburn, Alabama. I went to the USDA. Some of those ponds did contain the genetics from the slab lab in fingerling size, and they're they're down there and they're doing well. They're thriving and waiting until we figure out number one what we're going to do with our water. Number two, what is my stocking plan going to be? So I wanted to tell you guys sort of where my head is because I was hoping by now to be through resetting my water and sort of putting that front end work together and making that plan and executing on it. But I've had to slow down just a bit because number one, I'm looking at a couple of different options for what I need to do to work on not only the phosphorus out here, but to ensure that we keep water quality where it needs to be going forward. And that that's some big decisions I have to make. There's a couple of choices for products on the market right now. I'm working through all of that, some of which I'm actually working um, hand in hand with the companies themselves to sort of look at, you know, case studies. Can we make this a case study out here? Can this qualify to be a white paper study for the phosphorus binding that needs to be done and showcasing that this product does in fact do what it says it's gonna do? And, you know, that's fun for me because it's like, somebody's gonna get to come in here and say, I cleaned up the slab lab and now watch them grow the biggest bluegill all over again, but do it the right way and in the best format. So lots of different things I'm looking at with that. Number two, my stocking plan. Okay, this is where it gets interesting because I am looking at two options for stocking the slab lab and both have pros and cons. One is a little bit more advantageous, if you will, and the other one is a little bit more traditional. So for the one that I know everybody has been asking me about, because I've sort of alluded to the fact that I was considering this and a lot of people have asked me about it, I am looking at doing male only copper nose in this pond. There would not be any predator fish. There would not be any need to manage as intensively as far as water quality goes because you're not having any reproduction. And not having reproduction out here would cut down on population management and pushing this water to its limits. And basically we wouldn't have to struggle as hard to grow fish. We would be feeding only the mouths we want to feed and we wouldn't have to worry with continuous electroshocking, continuous water quality issues, it would help mitigate some of the things we've faced in the past. So what happens if you do a male only copper nose bluegill pond? When you delay sexual maturity on a male bluegill, you force him to do two things. Put all of his energy into eating and then all of that energy into growing. With bluegill with all fish it's energy in versus energy out as far as growing goes so if you can cut down on energy out on that fish all the energy they take in guess what they do with it they grow these fish would grow exponentially and in rapid time frame if we could pull it off because with all the pros there are there's two really big cons here we go with those the first con is number one you would stock in in a traditional stocking, you would stock in maybe a thousand bluegill per acre. So you'd be looking at 5,000 bluegill going in out here. To do something a little bit more like this, you would not stock in as many fish. You probably come in somewhere between 250 to 400 fish per acre. So at max, you're gonna have 2,000 fish in here, okay? This is the con. This is the side of the coin that makes that difficult. Number one, I can't just throw a bunch of fingerlings in here. Why? I can't sexually identify those fish. If I wanted to make it a straight up male only copper nose bluegill pond, I'd have to wait until those fish were four to six inches big. That is how I would be able to sexually identify. The drawback to that right now is that that's, that's gonna take time. I'd have to hand select 
Yes, hand select. Out of thousands of fish, I would have to hand select males only to go in here, which honestly, that's not that big of a deal. I'd be willing to spend the time to do that if I choose to go down that road. The other con to doing a male bluegill only pond is how do you prevent females coming in by way of eggs on a bird's feet? You can't. There's nothing you can do about that. You would have to uh, be very vigilant doing this because if you started to see fry in the water or started to see an increase in catch rates or more fish coming to feed, things like that, you would probably be like, mm, we've spawned, something has happened, there's a female among us. We can't have that. In theory, it, it sounds doable, and I like things that feel impossible, obviously. I've been whipped and kicked and beat like an old, you know, junkyard dog down here at this pond, and I'm still going. So, that's option one. Option two is more of a traditional stocking method. I have every faith and confidence that I can grow these bluegill. I am very, very fortunate to have learned, that was a beautiful butterfly, I am very, very fortunate to have learned so much over the last seven years, but really the last three years was kind of where I was getting my teeth, my teeth were cutting in in the last three years and I was really starting to get it. So, you know, either option, pros and cons, if I go the traditional method, you'd probably be looking at doing 800 to 1,000 bluegill per acre out here and then managing very similar to the way that we were, allowing them time to grow, spawn out, and then start removing females. But that would be great fishing out here. You could come out here and catch a fish just about every cast. And I don't know necessarily that we want that going forward. I don't think we ever want to be faced with thousands of pounds of floating fish ever again. I can tell you the day that the kill happened, I said that to myself. I said, I will not do this again. I will not do this again. I will not clean up this type of mess. I never want to experience that again because it was horrible. The slab lab's relatively shallow, and a lot of people have said, well, why don't you just dig it out and make it deeper? Okay, no. I don't have the time for that. I do not have the financial resources for that. So, I have yet again got to work with in the parameters that I have. There's so many ponds across the country right now that have had horrible summers in 2025 because of fish kills and because of cyanobacteria. And there has got to be a solution to this. And I am hoping that we can kind of you know, spearhead the movement forward and figure that out and let this be what it's always been, the slab lab. It's an experimental pond at this point. So I've got to think through all that and put all of that together. Working on the stocking plan is, that can be done pretty quickly. I just have to make up my mind. I just have to find time to go down there and sexually identify <laughs> 2,000 of them. You're looking at doing some really cutting edge stuff and, and that takes time to put together, you know? And I'm really excited about this, not only because I desperately want to feed fish and I miss my fish, but also because I think there's going to be an extremely huge amount of value in what we do out here. We are basically ground zero and we're gonna do, we're gonna live up to the Slab Lab name. So lots of things I'm gonna be bringing you guys. While we wait for fish to grow, I'm gonna show you how to grow them as well. I'm gonna show you how to feed train using a pellet feed ring. I'm gonna show you my four week guide that I have personally written and used out here for seven years to feed train fish. Lots of people ask all the time, I can't get them to come to feed. I'm out there, I'm hand throwing, or I've got my Texas hunter set for two seconds and there's no fish coming. You got to train them. And they are easy to train, but it does take a little bit of time. But you can do it in four weeks and I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, I'm probably going to be sharing a couple of shorts here and there of my adventures terrorizing my local creeks, streams, rivers, and uh, adventures that I've been doing with my five weight fly rod. And I want to tell y'all, number one, I want to catch fish. I want to catch fish. I want to grow fish. I want to catch fish. But I've also been taking that time to study very small bluegill in the wild. I am paying attention to how they move. And then I'm watching their behavior. And so that has been, it has been a vacation for me, which I've not had in years. So I've really enjoyed that. I'm going to continue to bring you those adventures as well. You know, lots of things to do. We've always got lots of things to do. At some point, Dad and I are going to sit down and talk to y'all together um, and, and we'll, you'll be able to ask some questions. Matter of fact, if you want to ask dad questions, send me an email. I'm going to put my email in the first comment below. And while you're down there dropping your email, like, share, and subscribe. 
please thank you. I'd appreciate it so much. As always, anything I can do to help you, if you want to bounce ideas, questions off me about your pond or starting a pond, I'd love to be the person that you come to. If I don't know, chances are I know somebody who does, and I'll be happy to get you that information. So yeah, that's, that's, that's where we are. It's going to be buck wild. If I choose to do this all male bluegill pond, yeah, that's going to be something. That's really going to be something. So I'm excited about the potential that that has. I'm also excited if I choose to do the traditional stocking method out here because most likely I'd be putting in some pure Florida bass uh, year, the end of year one, year two, help me with population control. And who wouldn't like to accidentally catch a pure Florida that's been eating slab lab bluegill? Need I say more? <laughs> The first time I get to cut my Texas hunter back on and fish come to feed, I'm probably going to cry. So just be prepared because it may be sooner than you think. All right, that's all I got for y'all today. I'm, I'm out. I'm out. I probably got to go study something about food webs and phosphorus and recruitment. You know, these are bluegill things that we have to think about. So I'll see y'all later. Thank you. Appreciate you. Bye.